Today we will be talking about infratemporal fossa. So before coming to the infratemporal fossa proper, we need to know where it is. You all might be knowing about temple. We have seen many temples. But do you know where the temple in our body is? It is here. So when you get a headache, we usually palpate this region and we could feel the pulsations of the temporal artery. So first we need to know where the temporal fossa is. So you know this is the lateral aspect of skull and this is what is meant by zygomatic arch. So the region above the zygomatic arch and below the superior temporal line, this depression is called temporal fossa. So by the word meaning infra, what does that mean? It is just below this fossa. So infratemporal fossa means the region line just below the temporal fossa. So today we will be dealing with the infratemporal fossa. So this topic is dealt under the following headings. First we need to know the boundaries. Boundaries of infratemporal fossa. Then we need to know the contents of infratemporal fossa. Then we need to know the communications. Communications of infratemporal fossa and a little bit of applied aspect. Applied aspect means why you need to study this topic or in which all aspects you will come across this infratemporal fossa. So these are the headings under which you will be seeing infratemporal fossa. So usually this topic will come for a 5 mark question or a 3 marks question. So if you get a 5 mark question, you have to start with the boundaries, the contents, a little bit in detail about the contents. Then you need to talk about the communications and the applied aspect. But if it is just for a 3 mark question, you just mention about the contents, not in detail. So that is how we deal with the infratemporal fossa. So first we will go on to the boundaries of infratemporal fossa. So when we move on to the boundaries of infratemporal fossa, we need to know what the shape of the infratemporal fossa is. So I will say that it is like a cube. So what do you mean by a cube? It is a space with six sides, isn't it? So it is a space with six sides. So this is one, two, three, four, five. Oops, we are not having a sixth side. So why did I omit the sixth side? Because infratemporal fossa, this side is open. That means the floor is open. So though we say that infratemporal fossa is like a cube, we have only five sides. Now what we are going to do is, we are going to name the sides. So first we will we'll start with the roof, the one which is seen above, that is called the roof. We will name it as roof. Then we have anterior wall, the wall which is facing anteriorly. So we will name it as anterior wall. Exactly opposite to the anterior wall, we have the posterior wall. Then you have the medial wall, which is facing medially. And you have the lateral wall, which is facing laterally. So what about the floor? Is there any flow for the infratemporal fossa? Definitely there is a floor, but it is not a closed floor. It is open. That means it is continuous with the sides of the neck. That is why we are not showing it as a side. So infratemporal fossa is in the shape of a cube without a closed floor. Now we will see what all will you get on each wall of infratemporal fossa. So we will start with the roof of infratemporal fossa. What are the structures forming the roof of infratemporal fossa? We have the bone. The bone is greater wing of sphenoid. Do you remember the foramina opening on the greater wing of sphenoid? You have actually three foramina in order from anterior to posterior. Foramen rotundum, foramen ovale and foramen spinosum. But all these three foramina are not opening into the infratemporal fossa. You have only two of these three foramina opening into infratemporal fossa. So which are the two foramina? They are foramen ovale and foramen Spinosa. So over the roof you have the bone that is the 
greater wing of sphenoid with two foramina on the greater wing. They are the foramen ovale and foramen spinous. So, these are the foramina which are opening into the cranial cavity that is mainly to the middle cranial fossa and on the other side it will be opening into the infratemporal fossa. So, that is all about the roof. Now, the next thing is when we talk about roof, the next thing which we go to is the floor of infratemporal fossa. So, the floor of infratemporal fossa, it is not a closed side. We have already mentioned it. So, where does it open into? It opens onto the sides of the pharynx. So, it is just continuing down along the sides. So if, if this is the vertebral column, it is just continuing down along the sides of the pharynx. So, that is about the floor of infratemporal fossa. Now, coming to the anterior wall. What about the anterior wall? Anteriorly, you can see that this is the lateral aspect of skull. Anteriorly, what do you have? It is the face. So, which bone is forming? This is the maxilla. So, the part of maxilla which is facing into the infratemporal fossa. So, that is called the infratemporal surface of maxilla. So, the anterior wall is formed by infratemporal surface of maxilla. So, one bone in the anterior aspect, infratemporal surface of maxilla. Coming to the posterior wall, I mentioned about the roof, we have mentioned about the floor, we have mentioned about the anterior wall. Now, we are moving on to the posterior wall. So, what is forming the posterior wall? It is mainly formed by the styloid process. So, this is the styloid process. Styloid process is coming in the posterior wall of infratemporal fossa. Now, we will move on to the medial wall and lateral wall. These are the two things remaining now, medial wall and the lateral wall of infratemporal fossa. So, what do you mean by the medial wall of infratemporal fossa? Medial wall of infratemporal fossa is formed by again one bone that is the lateral pterygoid plate, lateral pterygoid plate that is forming the medial wall of infratemporal fossa. And what about the lateral wall? The lateral wall is formed by the ramus of mandible. So, the lateral wall is formed by the ramus of mandible. So, these are the boundaries of infratemporal fossa. So, let us have a look where all these structures come in the skull. So, we can see that this is the infratemporal fossa. So, during dissection, you might have come across the infratemporal fossa. But how have you dissected the infratemporal fossa? In order to see the, this depression clearly, we need to cut the zygomatic arch. We need to make a cut anteriorly and posteriorly. And do you remember the muscle getting attached to the zygomatic arch? It is the masseter. So, how will you palpate for the masseter? When you clench your teeth, are you clenching? If you clench your teeth, you can feel for the masseter. So, that is the masseter which comes in the zygomatic arch. So, you make a cut anteriorly and posteriorly and you just reflect the zygomatic arch along with the masseter. So, then you will see the infratemporal fossa. So, we have mentioned the floor, it is open. What about the roof? This is the roof. My finger represents the roof. So, this is the roof which is formed by the greater wing of sphenoid along with the two foramina. You can see the two foramina, foramen ovale and foramen spinosum. Then anterior wall, this finger represents the anterior wall. So, this is maxilla and the anterior wall is formed by the infratemporal surface of maxilla. Posteriorly, you can see a pointed structure that is what is meant by styloid process. So, posterior wall is formed by the styloid process. Medially, we have already mentioned that is a thin plate of bone that is the lateral pterygoid plate. And what about the lateral wall? Lateral wall, we need to articulate the mandible. So, when you articulate the mandible, the lateral wall is formed by the ramus of mandible. So, this is the ramus of mandible. So, this fossa is infratemporal fossa.